name's Angela Burks and I'm the Director of Research Services in the Department. And welcome to today's research forum on representations of gender, teachers' everyday work. We are presented by Dr Lisa Van Leeft from the Queensland University of Technology. Unfortunately, Dr Ian Davis is unable to be here today and sends his sincere apologies. He is flying to China at the moment and have his dates confused for the forum. So Lisa has very kindly and generously offered to present his research on his behalf, in addition to her own. I wish to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the <coughs> that we gathered today, the Turrbal and Yuggera people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play in the education and the research community. Before we start some brief housekeeping, if people could please put their mobile phones onto silent. Bathrooms, if you have been in this building before, are located on the other side of the lift foyer, and in the event of an emergency, we have to move to the stairwell, which is located near the bathrooms and where instructions from the fire warden. Today's forum is being web conference through the department's learning place, and I extend a warm welcome to staff and stakeholders who are watching the forum today online. Our next forum is shown on the slide. It's on Friday the 6th of December, and it's titled Privileging the Voice of the Disenfranchised. This forum is timed to coincide with the end of the AARE conference in Brisbane, and will be a panel discussion featuring Professor Martin Mills, who's back from the UK, Dr. Nani Shea, Dr. Jenna Gillette Swan, and discussant Professor Bob Lingard. Details on how to register for this joint department and AARE special interest group event will be circulated closer to the time. Turning to today's presentation on representations of gender. Um, so Lisa, today um, this forum will share the research findings of two academics on gender issues within primary school contexts. Dr. Lisa Van Lee will present research about the texts that influence teachers and how they represent and or include genders and sexualities as part of their everyday work. She will reveal the influential texts and how they sway teachers' work, as well as the implications for schools and policy. Lisa will also present Dr. Ian Davis's work with the Primary Masculinities Project that addresses and classifies the difficulties that hamper effective recruitment and retention of male teachers within primary education. In cooperation with teachers and other stakeholders, the project aims to offer ideas and strategies regarding how to follow male teachers within this workforce. Today's forum topic is very much in line with the department's own priorities for a diverse and inclusive workplace. When all workplaces and schools adopt respectful and inclusive practices, the department's diverse workforce will benefit from effective service delivery through a representative workforce, enhanced attraction and retention of skilled employees, improved employee health and well-being, reduced absenteeism and improved output, increased workplace collaboration, engagement, commitment and motivation, and greater job satisfaction, better work performance and increased productivity. The department's LGBTIQ plus inclusion strategy was launched 12 months ago. In that time, we've received a bronze ranking in the Australian Workforce Equality Index. 5,000 employees have participated in LGBTIQ plus workforce inclusion awareness training. 8,000 lanyards have been distributed, 4,000 of those into schools, including Mornington Island, Mount Isa, and Barcaldon. 12 peer support officers have been trained and appointed across the state. Hundreds of employees are now members of the True Colours online network. The department is committed to achieving best practice in this space. Now, it's with pleasure that I introduce our speaker, Dr. Lisa Van Leet. Dr. Lisa Van Leet is a senior lecturer in the School of Teacher Education and Leadership within the Faculty of Education at QT. Her research interests concern teacher support in relation to relationships and sexuality education, particularly in regards to diverse sexes genders and sexualities, and the improvement in support for LGBTIQ plus students in schools. Dr. Lisa Van Lee has higher education undergraduate and postgraduate teaching experience. She has extensive experience as a primary classroom teacher. As we're web conferencing today, we'll leave most audience questions to the end of the presentation. So, you have my email. I'm very happy for people to use it if you wish to be in contact with me. 
and um, I'll get straight into things. I'd like to share with you a research project about the texts that influence the work of teachers and how they represent or include genders and sexualities as a part of their everyday work. The research was undertaken in a primary school and we were interviewed about the texts that influence them in how they make decisions and what they do about the ways in which they represent genders and sexualities. First of all, words are powerful in meaning making, representing identities and organising human social worlds. So I'd like to just go through a couple of um, words that I'm going to use in my presentation uh, first up. So the term sex, let's get straight down to the nitty gritty stuff, okay? The term sex is about biological characteristics, and usually language such as intersex, male and female are used when referring to a person's sex. So the basis of determining a person's sex includes chromosomes, genitals, hormones, and neurobiology. Very complex stuff, but there is a lot, uh, an amazing natural human diversity uh, in any combination of these attributes. So when a child is born, however, we often assign or describe their sex based on visible genitalia. Sex is not the same as gender. Gender identity is about a person's innermost concept of themselves as male, female, both, or neither. Gender expression is an external presentation which might be denoted by things like hair, clothing, behaviour, etc. One's gender identity and or expression might be the same or different from their sex assigned at birth. The term sexuality is about a person's physical, emotional, intellectual and some other bits and pieces that we don't have time to go into, attraction or not to other people based on desire, behaviour, and identity. And whilst I just define these terms separately, of course they are very much intertwined, and people's identities and concepts of themselves are complex, as are our children's and our schools. Text, uh, in this particular research project, is a term which refers to replicable institutional texts. And here I'm talking about things like policy, curriculum, literature, planning documents. The focus for the project is on how institutional texts coordinate teachers' representations of genders and sexualities as part of the everyday work, not on the teachers themselves. In terms of the texts that are produced and reproduced and shared and how they influence teachers' work. So educational policy and curriculum in formal education institutions and authorities are typically used to set the scene for local schools and educators. In Australia, of course, we have a national uh, education curriculum and we have national policies as well. We have state and territory authorities which also provide a context around curriculum and policy in which typically heteronormativity dominates. But of course, we're seeing more and more uh, diverse sexes, genders and sexualities as visible and embedded in such authoritative texts, which is what I'm going to explore uh, as we move through the presentation. So although it might be understood that curriculum and policy serve the work of teachers, Little is known about their influence on the nature of teachers' work in how they represent genders and sexualities, specifically in the primary school context. This institutional ethnographic study, building on the work of Dorothy Smith, investigates how curriculum and policy and other institutional texts uh, intersect to influence the work of teachers from one primary school. So, what did the teachers talk about? They talked about parents' voices, students' voices, media, localised school values, children's literature, curriculum and policy 
and they talked about how they work in complex and powerful ways to influence the work that they do. While texts like Parents' Voices might not be typically thought of as an institutional text, uh, I've tried to sort of reposition this idea of text in that Parents' Voices are invited into the institution um, of education or schooling and those voices are replicable in the way of PNCs, for example, at a state level and then down into school level PNCs. Uh, <clears throat> and so I refer to parents' voices and students' voices as texts uh, in this work. More typically though, um, texts such as curriculum uh, are replicable and accessible in different forms by teachers. So, how do they coordinate teachers' work? Um, I actually considered when putting this presentation together about doing some actual mapping exercises with you because it's actually really quite complex and I've got these big charts with um, institutional text sort of cut out as pictures and, and mapped all over the place uh, and I, I'd love to be able to roll them up and, and bring them here and map them out but I'll do my best to talk about it. So the texts work to coordinate how representations of genders and sexualities are socially constructed through teachers work. Genders and sexualities are typically represented as normalizing binary genders, boy, girl, and normalizing sexuality as heterosexuality and that's talking about that word I used before, heteronormativity, where heterosexuality is seen as the only normal form of sexuality. So I say this is typi um, typical, although it's not always represented in that way. And I'll, I'll share some examples. But diverse um, genders are represented sometimes uh, when teachers are talking about individual students and their identities, such as a trans student, for example, uh, and particularly if it's associated with their well-being concerns. Diverse sexualities are sometimes represented as diverse families, but mostly this concept of diverse sexualities is seen as taboo and is hidden. So. See, it's a bit crazy, <laughs> um, but hopefully you can sort of follow some of my logic. It's crazy uh, because in reality it is crazy. Of course, this kind of map suggests something linear, but of course the mapping is not linear. It's, it's iterative and, and messy um, because lots of people, uh, lots of texts influence the shape of uh, sort of overarching text or what I might call ruling text like curriculum for example how it's developed how it makes its way to the teacher so those pathways are very complex uh, and they're influenced by many different things and of course they would be different in different settings as well the Australian curriculum is replicable and produced as a text to inform teachers work um, but how does the curriculum coordinate how they represent genders and sexualities? So here's one example. The Humanities and Social Science curriculum states, considering a range of family structures, for example, nuclear families, one-child families, large families, single-parent families, extended families, blended step-families, adoptive parent families, and grandparent families. So I guess it depends on your world view how you might interpret that. Um, I might interpret that as heteronormative as it doesn't explicitly talk about complex or diverse families in terms of diverse genders or sexualities or how different families might be represented with that kind of a lens. But the phrase range of family structures informs the teacher that families do include a range of configurations. So whilst not stated directly in the curriculum, this might inform the teacher that same-sex parented families, for example, could be represented in the classroom as 
range of family structures. And of course there are teachers that I talk to that actually were doing that. So the curriculum provides a ruling structure for localized curriculum implementation. And so the curriculum can work in very powerful ways. Of course, it doesn't work in isolation though, and other texts intersect to shape the work of teachers. For example, parents' voices. So the perceived institutional discourse of negativity from parents on these particular issues um, often around diverse genders and sexualities and the perceived potential repercussions create a sense of fear and worry for teachers. Parents' voices influence the work of teachers, very much so. Some teachers describe how parent complaints influence the books that, they, that are kept in the library um, or classroom collection or home reader collection. The discourse of negative parent voice perpetuates the silencing and hidden nature of diverse sexualities as part of teacher's work. Alternatively, when it comes to promoting gender equity, particularly for girls, so there's particular kinds of gender equity, so I'm not talking about gender equity for trans or gender queer students here, I'm talking about um, sort of a broader feminist type perspective, um, discourse around women's rights and equality for women. Um, so parents' voices can work to empower teachers to represent genders, binary genders, in ways that critique gender equity. For example, a teacher described how a parent phone call and subsequent meeting prompted them to think critically about how a female character was portrayed in a home reader text. So the parent raised the bossy girl text with the teacher via phone and the parent and teacher then agreed to meet to discuss the text. The teacher then engaged in critical literacy practices with the students to interrogate the representation of girls in that particular text. So the parent voice in this instant, instance influenced direct pedagogical action on the teacher in how they represented gender as part of what they saw as their everyday work. Parent voice and this negative discourse is somewhat real, but it's also somewhat perceived. Um, but it really does influence teachers' work around how they represent genders, particularly male and female. They see their role as representing those genders equally. Uh, and that sexualities are taboo and not appropriate. Therefore, teachers' work is coordinated by parent voice to represent genders and sexualities as mostly heteronormative. Student voice as a ruling text. Teachers are also influenced by students' voices, both directly during classroom instruction and as individuals who might be seeking support and or guidance on gender and sexuality topics. While student voice is not typically viewed in the bounds of institutional text as described by the theoretical framework used, student voice is a discourse, again, that's invited into um, broader institutional texts, and it certainly has power in terms of influencing students' work, uh, influencing teachers' work, sorry. Some teachers describe how students raise issues and topics within the classroom that prompt them to represent genders and sexualities in particular ways. For example, some teachers describe how students say things such as, girls can't do that, or that's for boys, or I have two mums, and this influences their work to either openly discuss uh, gender equity or openly discuss diverse family relationships. Teachers see students' voices as permission, permission to discuss topics that might not otherwise be introduced via curriculum or policy texts. And some indeed are influenced by both. So for example, they might have a student who's got, um, say, who's got two mums, and then when they're reading the curriculum and it's talking about 
you know, um, diverse family relationships, they're putting those two things together and saying, well, actually, this gives me space to talk about you know, same-sex families and include that as curriculum work or as addressing students' needs. Teachers' work uh, is also coordinated by local school values such as local institutional texts, so school policies or school documents. And teachers describe how school values influence their work and how they represent genders and sexualities. Some teachers reveal that school values such as valuing diversity, and although they might have been written in mind for diversity as in cultural diversity, that, 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 that those kind of values prompt them to reflect about diverse genders and sexualities and how they are represented as you know, diversity, especially when students raise particular issues or um, if a student identifies as trans. The school values inform teachers' work in relation to the well-being of individuals and specific circumstances in which diversity arises. For example, respecting diverse family makeups and representing such family makeups through children's literature, for example, or other curriculum endeavours. Okay, so what does all of this mean? Institutional texts coordinate teachers' work to represent genders and sexualities as boy-girl norms and heterosexual norms, with minimal representation of the broad diversity of human sex, gender and sexuality. The implications for society at large rest with the underrepresentation of diverse genders and sexualities. And by not including diverse sexes, genders and sexualities, concepts of sex gender and sexuality and broader concepts like relationships and family uh, are not represented as normal aspects of human variation. Children with diverse sexes, genders and sexualities and or their families are represented minimally and heteronormativity dominates teachers' work and how they represent genders and sexualities. Then what happens is via this kind of silencing and omission children learn that diverse sexes, genders and sexualities are taboo and problematic. And this leads to poorer social, health and educational outcomes and life outcomes for those children and potentially their families who do identify or express this kind of diversity. So, after that kind of analysis or thinking, even though it's very brief, what do we, what do, we do then? What does the institution do? Um, and uh, I guess it's about um, deliberately um, thinking about policies and curriculum and um, review them, analyse them for their inclusion, for their representation, the explicitness of diverse sexes, genders and sexualities. For example, the Australian Curriculum has a section on, um, uh, um, I'm just trying to think the exact terms, I think it is diverse genders and same sex, something like that, I think that's what the exact words are in the, in the health and PE curriculum. But to find it, you actually need to go into a section, into a section, into a section and then scroll all the way down to the bottom and then you've got a little paragraph that says, you know, um, this is really important, this should be reflected, you know, throughout the curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a wonderful paragraph, um, but no one uh, in the school that I talked to actually even knew that it was there. So the head of curriculum, the, the principal, none of the teachers, no one was actually aware that that kind, and that's not a reflection of the teachers, I think that's a reflection of the structure of the curriculum and or how it's being delivered and rolled out, etc, etc. So um, I really, really want to keep the focus on, I guess, the institution and not on the teachers themselves. But I think that's an interesting aspect of what sort of came out of um, the, the research. Uh, so local school policies 
um, can be reviewed as well. With stakeholder buy-in, um, they need clear and comprehensive guidelines from authoritative bodies, so there needs to be a clear line of sight for schools to be brave and step forward. And I do think it is a brave move, potentially. Um, and, and so there needs to be that support there to make that kind of diversity visible and celebrated. I try to sort of um, make some analogies with how we think about cultural diversity. You know, and um, it's the same kind of, um, um, I guess it's just a nice sort of analogy or a relational way to think about how might we celebrate diverse cultures, how might we celebrate diverse families, and, and thinking about the kind of work that schools are doing around inclusion for diverse cultures, for example, and what that might look like for the LGBTIQA plus community. Uh, and I think it's really important to formally engage parents and community. And of course, schools need help to do this. Schools um, need help, institutional support. Um, principals and school leaders um, don't necessarily have the skills or knowledge um, required to do that kind of work. Uh, and part of that is that for the first time, QUT for example, our primary undergraduates for the first time are learning about relationships and sexuality education, which is comprehensive. Um, and so we don't have you know, trained teachers or trained leaders or trained heads of curriculum or trained support staff in schools necessarily. And I know that there is training happening, but I'm just talking about in terms of, you know, that, that's very recent. When we look at this as a big picture, as in the institution as a whole, schooling um, in Australia, you know, some of this work is really very, very recent. And so um, we need to keep those things in mind when we're thinking about, okay, well, what do we do next? Um, practice democracy. Ensure all voices are heard. For example, when do we ever hear about parents' voices who are supportive of literature being in classrooms that represent same-sex families? Okay. Actually, there's only a couple of studies in Australia that are very recent um, and some overseas but you know we don't hear those voices we don't hear those voices in the media for example and I think um, you know schools can definitely play a part in realizing that there are a variety of voices in this space um, that that need to be able to be heard and you know um, heard in order to move forward and I think engaging in a human rights perspective throughout the institution could be a valuable approach as well in terms of understanding the importance of, of people's rights to um, participation, to um, um, non-discrimination and those kinds of things. They're really important. So thank you. That's my presentation, all sorted. Um, but we're going to wait for questions to the end. So, yeah. Anyone got any questions? Hi. I would love to do that research. I think that's a great question. Um, I think it is really important to be able to explore things that are working well and understand how schools have worked with lo their, their local community to maybe address some of the things that might come up. Uh, but no, that, I haven't done that. And that hasn't been done, and it hasn't been done in primary schools. And it hasn't, definitely hasn't been done in Australia. There is some work in the UK that, um, um, the, where literature was introduced into the primary school context, which was representative of diverse families or diverse identities. And um, 
there is some work around yet yeah, the backlash and um, how teachers and schools as a whole school approach work to implementing those kinds of texts. Mm. But other than that, we're in a fairly unique new space. Yeah, look, anecdotally, I'm pleased to say, so for example, you know, I teach pre-service teachers and they go on PECs and I always ask them when they come back, did anyone see any teachers reading these texts or um, talking about these kinds of things? And every now and again, someone will say to me, yeah, this teacher read this text about all these different diverse families and the life just goes on <laughs> and there were no problems and it was great and you know um, how to capture that data I'm not sure how to go about doing that I think it would be nice to be able to capture that because I think that's potentially what schools need is to see that these kinds of things are happening and teachers are doing this work um, and you know there's not any major problems they're not hitting the front news or they're not being sacked or you know all of these things we, we, and they're not being abused by parents they're not having problems with their principal you know all the things that um, we do hear that teachers do what some teachers do worry about hmm. is there much guidance around the primary school teachers around what's age appropriate in introducing diversity into the classroom given that um, you know, they're still developing their understanding of sex itself. Mm. Um, and, yeah, is there a much documented around how to do that in an age-appropriate way? Yeah, there is a fair bit of information, particularly uh, out of the Netherlands and Canada and the UK. Um, I guess so content always comes up right so what are we talking about here when we're talking about teaching kids are we talking about teaching four-year-olds in prep sex you know and no that's not what we're talking about here it's part of what we're talking about in terms of when we think about what's developmentally appropriate and that kind of thing interestingly uh, in Australia children um, and their families, I think, tend to be much more open about um, sex and relationships and sexuality and concepts around gender um, than schools. Um, so, and I'm going to, I guess I can talk from personal experience, you know, I have a four-year-old and we were at a party on Saturday and there was a group of parents standing around saying, oh, our kids are asking questions about marriage and how baby, you know, where do babies come from? And they're like, Lisa, you're the expert on this, so what do we do? <laughs> um, but they're, ha they're already having open and honest um, conversations, you know, with their children about these things. And it kind of feels a little bit like we get to school and that's it. You know, we don't talk about these things anymore. Uh, and, and they're sort of, you know, sort of shut down and tucked away a little bit. Um, uh, and, and I think young children, like prior to school settings um, for families, receive lots of information in Australia. We have very good health promotion, health promotion around sex and sexuality. And so I actually think young children and their families uh, are accessing that kind of information and, and having, you know, very open uh, conversations you know um, there's some some work that sort of research uh, that talks about um, children being queerly raised you know children have access to media and um, you know all sorts of you know sort of external to the family opportunities to see different representations of genders and sexualities now more than ever before and especially with things like you know the same-sex marriage um, voting you know I think the conversation around the kitchen table the conversation with family and friends has become much broader and more open in general in Australian culture and of course children are a part of that and so I think we're going to see that coming up in classrooms more and more so um, you know, when I was in the classrooms, you know, five, ten, you know, twenty years ago, um, 
you know, kids were asking those questions. I think it's a natural part of, you know, human development. Uh, but, you know, kids were asking me how to, you know, two men have sex. I've had um, kids come out to me in pri as a primary school teacher. I've had, you know, I used to do silly things like stand on the basketball court and say, okay, boys versus girls. And I had one very brave little person say to me, can I stand in the middle with you? And thankfully, I at least said, of course you can, um, because they didn't feel like they could go either way, right? Uh, and, but now I wouldn't do that, you know, because I've learned a lot. But um, I, I, yes, does that answer your question? <laughs> Probably more so, and then some. Hmm. One more question. Yeah. I find um, that the biggest barrier is not so much staff and students being on board, it's the political side of it and the negativity that can come around with it. So my school recently did work Purple Day and we now have a gender neutral toilet and we unveiled that on work Purple Day and the kids were all for it and absolutely loved it. But all of the hoops I had to jump through before work Purple Day to make sure that everything that went out to staff was not forcing them to jump on board. It was very, if you want to participate, you can. Um, I didn't sit, receive any negative feedback about it, which was great. Fabulous. Um, but I think the hardest part is actually like, I, to be honest, was like, okay, can we do this? And expect it to be pushed back. But when we got it, I was like, oh, sweet. And then so we got to do it. Um, and there's just, I think, like you said, kids, like it, it all started four months ago when my kids said, I don't want to be called she in class. I'm like, okay, cool, sweet. So in class we use gender neutral terms. You know, and it's starting to, you know, roll out across the school. But yeah, I think that biggest barrier is not so much our own personal beliefs and opinions or other staff or students. It's that hoops that we have to jump through to, because it is such a political thing at the moment. Yeah, and that's why I love this work because the focus is on the institution and how those texts um, you know, map and intersect and make their way to, you know, influence, you know, you, and your example is a perfect example, you know, there's, there's political text, there's policy text, there's curriculum text, there's, you know, um, school level text that all, that you had to navigate um, to do what you did, you know, um, and so I think it's really important for us to have a look at how they work and see if we can work to make those texts uh, work in really effective ways that we want them to work. Mm. Thanks, Sharon. Mm. All right, I'll do my best to represent Ian's work. We'll see how we go. So uh, Ian's work is all about uh, masculinities and understanding the experiences of male teachers in primary environments. I'm going to read this to you because I think it's really powerful to hear it as voice. I had been on prank in a school in the city. I did the induction policies and stuff. They told us that for men, if you get touched or hugged by any of the kids, raise both your arms over your head and catch the eye of another adult. I was dreading this happening. After two weeks, something happened where a boy ran towards me and hugged me around my middle. I raised both my hands in the air, but my shirt moved up and my belly was out. The kid was on me. The learning assistant looked at me. She was horrified. As soon as I could, I went out to my car. I had a real cry. I felt ashamed of myself for what had happened. I was going to be accused of inappropriate behaviour and I worried I would fail my placement. So this is Sam. Sam resigned from his studies a month later. He abandoned his degree and did not pursue his ambition to become a primary school teacher. Unfortunately, this is not an isolated experience. Sam's story is one of many that describe how masculinity can be experienced with an intense sense of discomfort, a distrust in the contemporary primary educational setting. So the background of this work is that there are a critical lack 
of male teachers moving into primary education in Australia. This has become considered as just normal, uh, even traditional, rarely ever viewed as problematic. Uh, so the numbers that we're looking at are 92% female teachers, 8% male teachers, that was 2013. But um, Ian notes that this profile has remained relatively unchanged for about 10 years. So to date, very little attention has been given within the Australian context to this slow and steady decline in male teachers working in primary schools. See, this gender imbalance has recently been highlighted by the Australian Council for Educational Research as one of the key factors contributing to a current teacher shortage in primary education in Australia. This has been further exacerbated as male teachers working within the primary sector are retiring and we're not successfully um, re-recruiting. The following systematic literature review uh, explores research that has taken place in the last decade regarding the lack of men in primary education and it identifies several key themes that have been well interrogated as well as a number of significant gaps perhaps requiring further attention. So there are four key themes. Uh, the review began with 127 papers which were refined to 47 and ended up as 32 in the final um, review. So we're going to go through each of the themes. So theme one, training, employment and retention. So this theme uh, brings up some issues around um, policy work and um, the problem of recruiting and retaining males in the teaching profession. Um, the experiences of male teachers operating in a feminised environment. Problems surrounding the term feminised and assumptions of deficit relating to women teachers suggestion that women teachers are incapable of relating to the unique learning needs of boys. The literature also looks that, um, that this inability is framed unfair, unfairly, perhaps as the primary cause of boys' apparent underachievement and disadvantage status in primary classrooms. How masculinity is negotiated, reworked and performed locally and in different ways by men teachers and how men attributed the qualities they associated with being a good primary school teacher, such as sensitivity, caring, creativity, to strong maternal connections and explicitly rejected hegemonic definitions of masculinity. Uh, so Ian would like to point out here that feminization of education is a really sort of distracting point that focuses or shifts away from looking at male teachers experiences in particular. And that perhaps it's a, an uncomfortable thing to do. Thing two, factors and expectations. So here the literature talks about what motivates men to choose primary teaching as their career and what they think the expectations are for them in that context. The cultural and social stigma often associated uh, to men, the notion that recruitment drives aimed at diversifying the student body, taking up pre-service teacher education courses might benefit from, the increasing, uh, from increasing the attractiveness of teaching using targeted population specific approaches. Um, and uh, Sam, who we met on the very first slide, um, is a story about a 23-year-old young man who was uh, talked about his experiences being terrified of being the male role model in the school and that there was lots of pressure, he felt lots of pressure on him um, and the young men coming into the profession, that that was the expectation put on them. That you know, there were certain ways that they had to be to fulfil that. 
gender roles and the impact of those roles on both the emotional and intellectual development of primary school students. Uh, how masculinities are commonly regarded as a globally shared concept. So uh, he, he's got mistakenly there, of course, um, masculinity is, is different in different cultures, uh, is different across time uh, as well. How masculinities can equally be locally and specifically produced within individual settings and that they are fluid and responsive to the cultural and social needs of the location. That children in primary school settings benefit emotionally and intellectually from having a balanced representation of genders as part of their experience of school. And I'll talk to Ian about his concept of genders there and expanding on male female teachers and what that might mean and the implications of that. I'll work on that. I'll get back to you. The significant pressure on male teachers to be the role model, performing hegemonic masculinities, which we mentioned from, from Sam. And this theme of sexuality and risk. So the literature in this area is both brave, but at times very confronting. The attempt to unravel what has been regarded as the unspeakable aspects of gender in education. How seemingly impossible it is for male teachers to exhibit with any level of comfort or safety any other type of masculine identity that deviates from what might be considered safe. Also, a consideration of the projections of anxiety, risk and desire that male teachers are being asked to manage with very little support perhaps from you know, the, either local networks or extended sort of working environment. What is telling is how different methodologies are within this area with an increased use of critical analysis and the application of theoretical frameworks such as psychodynamic and critical theory. So Ian's got a note here about the crux of the problem. A student was asked, why are you seeking contact with children? by a principal, and when he says student, he means pre-service student. Um, you know, there are threats from fathers, um, teachers are um, surveillance by other staff in the school, um, by parents, um, the community as well. So that literature uh, is quite telling. So the four themes appear to have a texture of their own that training, employment and retention is an area more than any other where the feminization of the primary environment was debated, the outcome of which is found as showing up in the other themes. So factors and expectations discussed how there are clearly systemic barriers in place which are deterring men from considering teaching as a possible career. Another little anecdote I can add there when uh, you know, QUT, we have a um, expose where students and their families can come and talk to us about the degrees that they do. And, um, you know, I had a, a mother and her son come um, to talk about what an education degree might look like or, you know, the benefits that that might bring for, for them. And um, the first thing she said to me, are there many other male kids enrolled? I thought, wow. You know, this is, this is a thing, like this is right out there. People are thinking about it before they even, you know, as a really important point of, you know, this is about this young person's career. And, and that was a really big influencing factor in their decision making. Um, the role and impact argued that both boys and girls in a primary setting equally benefit emotionally and intellectually by, in, by being exposed to a balanced representation of genders as part of their educational process. Um, interesting, another little anecdote from some of the data that, that I collected in, in my project where um, one of the teachers actually talked about uh, a feminised pedagogy and a masculinised pedagogy. Uh, and I thought, wow, that's quite fascinating. I haven't sort of heard those terms before. And um, it was really interesting to explore because the teacher talked about how um, the, as a man teacher and as women teachers that they adopted these kind of 
pedagogies, regardless of their own gender or identity or expression, to achieve certain pedagogical goals. Um, so I'll write a paper about that and, and get back to you but <laughs> one day. But I thought it was really fascinating, this idea of um, yeah, a feminized pedagogy or a masculinized pedagogy, and that be a deliberate pedagogical choice to achieve a certain outcome is very interesting. Um, sexuality and risk, using different me methodologies, explores how safe masculinity is within a primary school setting and the promotion of heteronormalism as a permitted requirement for all teachers and all institutions. So that's just talking about how teachers are expected to be heterosexual as well uh, and that that be, be normal uh, and, and accepted and what is permitted. Which of course we're making great inroads here in Queensland <laughs> around changing some of that which is fabulous. So um, I guess um, Ian's work is really about highlighting some of the issues that um, I guess we as a, as a community, um, as an institution face in terms of um, males or men's experiences in primary schools as male teachers and the implications for that in terms of um, recruitment and retainment um, or a balance of representation of genders in the workforce. Um, Ian also wanted to share with you that he is about to embark on a project with Brisbane Catholic Education to begin a 12-month research project to assess how they, as an organisation, are approaching um, this particular problem. So I think there will definitely be more to come from Ian on this. Uh, and I think that project will have some really uh, interesting findings and further implications um, for what's happening in Queensland at the moment on these issues. So, thank you from Ian. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that I could probably answer too many questions, but you can ask and I'll try. Or I'll say, no, I don't think I can answer that. But if, um, I'm open if, if anyone would like to ask any questions. Or even if you just want to have a talk about it. Sorry, did you have a did you have a question up for that? No. Any questions online? Uh, are the benefits like so overwhelming that there's a massive need um, uh, to have more high school or male primary teachers? Uh, that's a good question. I don't actually think we know the answer to that. I think we can only hypothesise. Mm. Only because, say, once upon a time where we may have had more men as teachers in education, there were so many other variable factors that we can't, we can't know that. We can only suggest that perhaps that it might actually be useful, given the makeup of our society, that we then reflect that in our education system. That's the general hypothesis. Mm. I think um, that he raises the figures of 92% female, 8% male, and that's why we're starting, is not reflect the leadership of the same gender as well. So when you see how males tend to be more likely to be in the role, so that's their, their role models, you see how rather than staying in the country. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 Good point, thank you. I'm using my teacher scanning eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember when you presented this research back at the ARA conference in Canberra and he talked a little bit about 
if it's related to one of the themes around that expectation of a male teacher, that they're not just there to be a teacher, as you said, they're there to also be a role model, mm -hmm. um, and that they're often typecast into particular roles within the school. In yeah, like the PE teacher, the PE teacher yeah, the, the science teacher. Sort of, you know, um, so they're not just there to be a teacher, they're there, there to be something else as well, and that's the challenge that they face, that, that it's not okay for them to have a different way of expressing um, their gender. Yeah. They have to be the typical male, they can't, they're yeah. expected to, you know, as you say, be like a PE teacher and they can't be a bit feminine, for example, in the way that they express themselves. Yeah, that's right, and that's that term. Um, hegemonic masculinity, so um, that that Ian uses there, uh, yeah, it's it's a powerful um, cultural way of being, yeah, yeah, and it has has broad ranging implications, yeah, because we're also then teaching our young people that as well, mm. yep. I don't know. I don't think so. No. It'd be interesting to know. I wonder if yeah, we might be able to look at that, like what our uptake is. I mean, we get such high uptake out of QUT, for example, anyway. Like our employment uptake is something, I think, don't quote me, but it's like 95% or something. It's very high. So I'm not sure that you'd be able statistically to to draw any conclusions from that anyway, mm, but I'm not a statistician, statistician or <laughs> but that might be something that, yeah, uh, I can ask Ian and I can look at. Mm. And we're certainly investigating uh, our, um, you know, students who drop out of our education courses. Who are they? Why they're dropping out? Yeah, same, same kind of work being done within the institution. So no doubt that's a question being asked as well. Are we seeing a higher rate of male dropout? You know, or well, people who identify as men um, dropping out across that time? Mm. <laughs> I guess following on from that, with the example of Sam, you said that there were other examples very similar to that. What kind of support are we giving for um, teachers who identify as men um, that we can retain them rather than having an example where they just assume that you know, they're done for and there's no point from coming back from that situation? Um, so when you say we, do you mean the Department of Education? Or even outside of that, um, educating the, you know, the school, you know, making sure it's not just black and white and understanding the situation. Mm. Yeah. Well, I guess I can talk from the university, you know, our perspective in terms of, I guess, by introducing um, <clears throat> and making very visible um, 
a range of identities and you know what gets valued across our curriculum. Um, and I think that's part of it. Uh, and doing things such as you know we have um, a stepping in and a stepping out conference for our um, our pre-service teachers. And so you know Ian, for example. You know, I know he does some work at Griffith as well, where he talks to teachers about some of these issues, and so actually highlighting them and, and bringing them forward so that people are able to to discuss them and talk about them, I guess, is a start or you know something. Yeah, um, I think um, you know we have sort of support systems in place, such as like, we have an ally network. For example, I know that you know pre-service teachers have approached me as a um, visible ally um, to talk about what that means for them being a gay male teacher or pre-service teacher, and what they worry about going out onto their professional experience or the implications or what this means for them in the future, and um, people are having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Mm, but if you want to talk, I have that sound experience, I've experienced that. I've been in a classroom and written on a whiteboard and had my shirt on, and then been taken to the office to explain while I was exposing myself because I was a table to say. Or if you stand near a doorway and then you have this, the accusation of that you're there, so you're there to the doors rub their breast on your small part, you do get faced with those sort of things. Like I'm not going to get a practice. Hmm. For myself, I, well, I didn't think I was doing wrong where I was standing where I was doing it only because the impact was made and then you have to explain yourself to a deep feel why you're standing at the door or why your shirt was raised up and running. That's a really embarrassing thing to have to do when you're just doing you know, clothing malfunction and just did self-sufficient way. Like, it's really hard and if you don't know, you can be caught out. You know, and it's just innocent. And actually, I have a hand, I don't touch any student. I don't high five students, they have do that high five or I don't even touch them. Because it's just you just get to the stage now to just stop touching. Which is unfortunate. So it just doesn't work hard. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we talk about masculinity and some of these issues and how we understand gender and relationships, you know, there's a much broader sort of cultural understanding about, you know, how we, how we interact based on, you know, our gender expression and what that means for us socially. Uh, and, of course, we see it playing out in schools in these kinds of situations. I think there are definitely broader questions to be asked as a community, you know, for our own culture about how we want things to be. Hmm. And how do we change that and what do we do? I have some interesting perspectives on that. Like we don't celebrate, like parents don't get excited that you've got a female teacher. You know, I'm, I'm not, I don't, I don't mean to disregard what you're saying, I understand what you're saying. And I think those positive stories are really important. But I think we need to also think really carefully about how do, how do they then position the other or how do they then position what, we, what else we don't do, you know? Maybe we just need to say it doesn't matter. Uh, in one sense, uh, and look at, hey, this is a really great person, they're a great teacher for these reasons. Uh, 
Um, but how do we get to that point? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's going to be done easily or, <laughs> you know, how do, how do we get there? Because you're right, and maybe those positive stories are part of that journey of moving towards that. Can I go back to the least practices at least a male teacher as a mentor? So then learning, do you know what I mean? Because if you're... It is, you're hearing those positive stories there because that, that male teacher has been there for a while. So you're getting those positive stories. But this, because I've been a teacher for a while, so there are positive stories to be held. But there are those negative ones because the practice will take them. But if our perhaps students are getting those stories, the positive vibe, from a good role model, because that's what mentors are. Yeah. So have great mentors. Yeah. So that's the way you can see it as well. Yeah. 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 I, I think there's so many strategies that could be put into place to um, work on some of these issues, yeah. And they're great suggestions. Yeah. And um, so speaking of positive stories, you mentioned in your research that, that there are teachers out there who start talking about more diverse family structures in the, in the lessons. Were there any specific sort of um, characteristics or conditions you, you saw that made the teachers aware and confident in raising these issues? Yeah, um, so I think um, it's the in intersections of those institutional texts. So when you've got a teacher who is aware of what's in the curriculum and they've got some local school-based policies that sort of support um, that interpretation and then they've got a student and or a parent um, voice, um, when those things sort of collide, that seems, you know, that was an experience where um, I could see that teacher then actually introduced um, literature that was representative of a diverse range of families, including a same-sex family. Um, uh, into the classroom directly, yeah, and with no broader ramifications, other than the teacher felt like they were meeting the curriculum needs uh, and they were meeting the needs of the student and satisfying the broader s cultural values of the school. Great question. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate um, being able to share that research, and it's the first time that I've been able to share that and talk about it publicly, and thank you to the Department of Education for um, approving that the research be done <laughs> um, so that we can get some of this work done and, and then inviting us to share it. So thank you very much. It's very exciting. Thank you. It's a really interesting topic, and you know, we're still traversing the challenges of it, aren't we? Yeah.